Hi guys. This is me because I can't talk into this. Um, so this is Ricky. He uh, came to work in Ansible Group not too long ago to work on all of our new fancy cool networking modules. Uh, one of our other co-workers is sort of the master of those things. No. <laughs> um, <laughs> I can do it. It's okay. Anyway, so Ricky's going to talk about automating the entire IT stack, including some stuff in there about networking. If you were dying to learn about networking, we're happy to probably chat with you about some of the state of that stuff. But um, there's the, the fun thing about Ansible is you can automate uh, everything on Earth, and networking's in here. So yep. just FYI, the A community pulling it all together. Okay. So yeah, so the title of this session is using Ansible to automate the entire IT stack. So who am I? So I'm Ricardo Carrillo Cruz, although you can just call me Ricky. I joined Ansible by Red Hat recently, which I'm very excited. I work primarily on Ansible networking, so I personally um, own the Cisco uh, modules for routers. I also own Open the Switch and a bunch of other stuff. I'm also a maintainer of the Ansible OpenStack modules, along with Monty, Jesse, Julia, and some other people, David, I think, also. And I previously worked as an AppStream developer in OpenStack. I'm also part of the OpenStack Infra team as Paul, Monty, and Jim. So what is Ansible? So at this time, I'm I'm sure everybody knows it. I mean, there, there's been a bunch of sessions before me. So this is an automation platform. You can automate all things of your IT organization with it. It's simple because it uses YAML. Even if you don't know Ansible by reading a YAML file, you can sort of infer what's going on. It's agentless. You don't need to install anything on, on your target servers to perform change. So Ansible is just going to connect to them, do its thing, move to next task, then move to next server, so on and so forth. So it's extensible. It has a plugin architecture. So pretty much all the major uh, functions or behaviors of Ansible are plugin based. So for example, you are mostly familiar with Ansible SSH connection method, where you just connect to a machine with SSH, you do a thing. But because it's a plugin based, the connection type, um, we have plugins for WinRM for Windows. We have plugins for Docker containers that does a Docker exec thing. Chiroot, as Paul said. There's also callback plugins. We have um, um, hooks along the playbook execution where you can do things. So, oops, this is beeping. Oh. OK. Done. <laughs> so we have also callback plugins. So Ansible, you can put hooks into a play execution and do things when a play starts, when a play ends, when there's failure, when a task starts, so on and so forth. So you can actually write a plugin to do things during the stage of that play. So as a matter of fact, so we have a, a colleague, uh, David Simard, who wrote a really cool call black plugin uh, named Nara, which uh, helps to visualize Ansible runs. And we use that in OpenStack Infra. Batteries included, lots of modules for doing all sorts of tasks config management, provisioning, everything. So use cases. So yeah, you can do provisioning, whether you, you want to provision physical servers or there are Ansible projects. You can also provision cloud resources. Obviously, you can use it for config management. This is one of the um, greatest misconceptions about Ansible is that most, a lot of people, they just uh, think about Ansible for config management, but Ansible can do you know a, a lot of other things. Uh, you can do application deployment, continuous delivery, security and compliance, 
overall, in my opinion, so Ansible is a great orchestration tool because with orchestration, you can just do, uh, you, you tell a machine what you want to do. So this is a typical IT stack. So you probably saw this in some slide in your company, by your management, by your directors, um, probably variations of it. So typically, what you can find in an organization is you have the hardware, your networking devices, storage, physical servers. Then you install an IAS, OpenStack, to better manage that. Lately, it's very popular to have COAs on top of it. Put a Kubernetes or a PaaS on top of OpenStack. Then you have a, your virtual resources, which are the things that you create on your OpenStack or in your COEs. And then finally, your applications, web apps, whatever. So in this talk, I'm going to deep down, go from bottom up, showing how Ansible as a project and as an ecosystem gives you tools to manage every layer. So we start with uh, hardware layer and networking. So Ansible has over 250 network modules. It's an amazing list of network modules. So we have pretty much every major vendor there. So we have Cisco, Arista, Juniper, Huawei, F5, OpenSwitch, Dell, you name it. So we have modules for managing routers, switches, firewalls, load balancers, as the components of OpenSwitch. The modules for networking, they have a consistent interface. That's very important because most organizations, they're not just a Cisco shop or a Juniper shop. They have a, a variety of devices. So we strive to have um, a defined interface in our modules so you can find the same kind of logic amongst every vendor. So we have, for example, a config module for Juniper routers and for Cisco routers and for Arista routers and so on and so forth, which is going to configure those devices. We also have a command module that allows you to run one of commands in those devices. So that's what I mean by having that consistency. So we have multiple transport support. So obviously we support SSH, which is the fallback or default um, mechanism for managing devices. But we also support vendor APIs. So for example, Cisco and XOS is um, a product line of switches that Cisco builds. And they have something called NX API. We support it. Uh, Arista has also eAPI, which is something similar. Our modules we put into 2.3, a persistent connection framework, up till 2.3 uh, network plays with Ansible where I'm very fast. The reason is because we have to use Paramico, and Paramico doesn't have a concept of open SSH control persist. So the reason why we have to use Paramico is, is because with the default SSH plugin, you, you expect to have a, a shell on the target device. That's not something you have in, in a network device, because you were talking to a, a proprietary shell. So, we're bound with Paramico. So we build this framework that allows us to have that same functionality of control persist, which is about really opening an SSH connection and have it open during the entire play, so you don't have to open and close the SSH connection on every task. For that persistent connection framework, so we wrote new connection plugins, uh, network CLI, which is the the, 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 the plugin for accessing the CLI on devices via, via SSH. We also have a NetConf on Juniper, which is a Juniper, um, sorry, NetConf is a, <laughs> it's a standard, it's an XML RPC protocol that is defined in, on IETF for managing network devices. We plan to double down NetConf on all our modules, not just Juniper but put into Cisco, Arista, so on and so forth. This is a test playbook 
by using network modules. In this case, so we're managing an iOS XR device, which is a carrier grade router on, on the Cisco portfolio. So we use this system module that allows us to uh, configure settings on the device, in this case, domain name, domain search. And then we have the iOS XR config module, which allows us to run uh, a list of commands against a, a particular config subsection. In this case, we run those lines against the context of the interface to Gigabit Ethernet 0000. So, storage. We also have modules for managing storage. We have modules for managing NetApp devices, for managing Infinidad. We also have a module for block device partitioning, uh, the, part, the part and module which allows us to create partitions on, on hard disks. We have the file system module for creating file systems, ext4, ext3, RiserFS. We have also modules for managing ClusterFS, ZFS, also modules for logical volume management, LVM, and finally for storage transports like NFS and ISCSI. We have modules for ISCSI targets and the NFS, we can just use the mount module for um, defining the FS tab, and that's it. This is an example playbook. So in this case, this could very well be used for preparing and a storage node for uh, an OpenStack cloud. We partition this DB uh, disk. We create the partition number one as uh, an LVM type. And then we create a volume group called Cinder Volumes, which itself is within the DebSDB1 um, physical volume. So now we move on to servers, which is the final part of the hardware layer. As an operator, so we need to provision servers, which is the process of putting an OS into a server. And then config management, which is managing the, the OS of that server. Um, so for, for provisioning, we have inventory and some sort of integrations with uh, very popular provisioning systems like Cobbler or Foreman. But I'm going to talk about Bifrost because it's an OpenStack project and it's also Ansible native. Uh, I'm not going to talk much about this because uh, uh, Julia made a talk this morning and she knows a lot more than myself about Bifrost. It's just that we used it in Infra with great success. Um, it's a collection of playbooks and roster provision services. Just do that. It doesn't intend to be a CMDB like Foreman does or it's just for putting a base image on a server, and that's it, and it works really well. It uses Ironic in a standalone mode. If you attended the keynote this morning, there's a big effort for having OpenStack services to not be used just with OpenStack and being able to be use it, using it in a standalone. Ironic is a service that allows to do that. It's very simple to use. It's it's just made of three phases, so you install the Bifrost dependencies, which is the NS mask, Ironic, uh, Dib, create a base image. You create an inventory that you, where you define your, uh, the, uh, your servers, which MAC addresses of your interface, what host name you want on those servers, your RPMI username and passwords so you, you, so you can boot them up. Then you enroll. Um, those servers into the ironic database and finally the deploy phase which is just going to do the magic of booting up of powering on the machines with IPMI and booting with Pixie a base image with an ironic agent talks to ironic server pulls which uh, image is supposed to be deployed on that server and the agent deploys it and done it leverages the Ansible OpenStack Ironic modules, so we have in the Ansible project modules to, to manage Ironic, and Bifrost just leverages those modules. As a matter of fact, I think just the Bifrost uh, developers wrote them for the most part. Then when we need to do config management, and obviously 
Ansible can do config management. It's known to be a great tool for doing it. You can do user management, package installation, service daemon control, whether you need to configure files and, and services, you're covered. This is an example playbook. So with APT, we're installing Apache 2 package, doing an apt-get update. That's what update cache means. Then we're configuring the virtual host conf Jinja2 file with uh, some variable that we, we fit to the Ansible playbook binary. That's what the domain conf in double mustaches means. And then we make sure that we start the Apache 2 service. We can also use Ansible in ad hoc mode. That's something that uh, some people do not know this. So you can actually use Ansible to reach the servers you have in your inventory and run things on it and get Im immediate results. So for example, by using Ansible web servers dash a uptime, so that's going to run uptime command against all, the ser all your web servers defined in your inventory, and you're going to get back the results. Reboot, the same thing for reboot, and the last one, um, that's a very neat one. If you want to gather facts about uh, your web servers or whatever servers you have in inventory, just pass dash m the tab. It's going to gather facts against all them, spit them into your standard route. So it's very good for doing reports or checking out that um, there's some config drift or whatever. But anyway, ultimately, your Ansible playbook should be the source of truth. So just run Ansible at hoc as an emergency thing or for very little things. Just use your Ansible playbooks uh, for, depl for deploying change in your service. Put them into version control, code review in a CICD pipeline. So now we cover the hardware layer. We're now up into IAS, which obviously we're going to talk about OpenStack. So how, as uh, operators, we can use uh, Ansible to deploy OpenStack. So there are m three main projects, Triple O Quickster, OpenStack Ansible, call Ansible. So Triple O Quickster is just an Ansible wrapper to, that uses Triple O itself. So Triple O is an end-to-end -end solution to install, configure, and manage, monitor, it does everything of, on an OpenStack cloud. So the name stands for OpenStack on OpenStack, that's what triple O means. It has the concept of two clouds, so when you install OpenStack with triple O, you install an all-in-one cloud that is called the under cloud, and then you leverage the components from uh, from that under cloud of the stack to deploy the over cloud, which is going to be your tenant or end user facing cloud. That's what I mean by dog food in OpenStack. Supports virtual, bare metal, container as over clouds. So I'm, I'm aware that Triple O, they, they now moving into the Dockerized um, services. This is a diagram that shows what I just depicted. So operator, under cloud, end users. Over cloud. And the Triple O Quickster just allows you to de deploy Triple O in a very easy manner with Ansible for virtual environments. It uses libvirt to create networks and VMs for both under cloud or um, over cloud. Triple O Quickster is great for dev environments with Triple O and also for CI purposes. They use it, Triple O folks use Triple O Quickster now in the gate. It's easily extensible by using Triple O Quickster extras. So there are roles in that project for installing Triple O Quickster on bare metal, for example. They have roles for CI usage. So feel free to have a look and maybe contribute. Then we have the OpenStack Ansible project, which installs OpenStack component on LXC containers. You can also install services on bare metal, but by default, they install it in LXC. They allow better isolation and maintenance because every service process in, it's in within its container. So you can keep 
its very own dependencies and it's, it's better for, for upgrading, for example. It deploys OpenStack services from source, so it doesn't leverage any kind of RPM or DEB. It just, you just do a git checkout, OpenStack Ansible, whatever tag of Newton or whatever, and that's the thing that is going to use to deploy your cloud. It has some Ceph Ansible integration. This is a great, a great example of how communities can just, you know, collaborate. Uh, the Ceph folks, they thought that Ansible was great for installing and managing Ceph. And the uh, OSA folks, they just integrate with them instead of reinventing the wheel. One of the cool features that it has is that it has a security hardening STIG role that you can run in post installation. So STIG is some sort of a security compliance standard. So you can run that role after you install your cloud and it's going to address any kind of security issues it finds to match that criteria. This is a workflow for OpenStack Ansible. It's very, sim very similar to other mechanisms. You prepare your deployment host, install Ansible. You prepare your target host, configure networking and storage. Configure deployment, which is configuring how many, what services you want in your cloud, what um, passwords, so on and so forth. Then you run the playbooks with Ansible, and it's going to connect and create LXC containers for your configuration. Finally, we have the Kala Ansible project. So the Kala project provides Docker containers for OpenStack services. So this is a very cool project. So they create containerized OpenStack, uh, so containerized service for every op OpenStack project. So for Nova, it's going to create a Nova conductor, Nova API container, and it's going to upload them into Docker Hub. So anyone can just reuse them. As a matter of fact, the triple O folks, uh, they started the containerized story and they're just leveraging um, those containers from Cola Project, which is very cool. The Cola Ansible is the Cola deployer of OpenStack, so it's just an Ansible project that leverages the Cola containers to install an OpenStack cloud. The configuration is really easy, it's just you configure globals.yaml, and passwords.yaml, just five parameters. It has a, a lot of very same defaults, so it's great to get going. It uses a custom configuration sections instead of templating, so instead of exposing every possible parameter for every possible service as an, in the Ansible role, you can just fit your particular customized Nova Conf into Cola and it's going to just put that into the image and that's what's going to be deployed when you install it. It's very fast to deploy, very fast, highly scalable. I, I recommend that you have a look in a uh, talk that Steve Dake and Sammy Apple gave in some other summit. Uh, they did a demo and think it took like 18 minutes to deploy a highly available um, OpenStack cloud. Really cool stuff. So now we've gone one layer up I'm not going to talk about every possible path or every possible COE, obviously. I'm going to talk about Kubernetes because it's the most popular these days, and, and OpenShift, which is a path that is based on Kubernetes as well. So what can we do with Ansible to deploy Kubernetes? So we have two options here. We could use Magnum, which is COE as a service project in OpenStack. This is a very cool project. It's an API you can poke, and it allows you to deploy COEs within OpenStack. It allows you to provision Kubernetes, Docker Swarm, and Mesos, and it does that by abstracting uh, things in a cluster template and a cluster tags, which is a construct for abstracting the, the various differences between Kubernetes, Docker Swarm, and Mesos clusters. Leverage OpenStack capabilities for authentication, volume, image management, networking. So you're going to use Keystone for deploying your clusters. It's going to use Cinder to expose volumes to your containers. And it's going to use Neutron to create networks to your containers. 
one of the cool things of this is that, for example, there's a new project, cool new project. Well, I wouldn't say new, but it's called Courier that allows to connect or bridge your container networking with your OpenStack ne neutral networking. So you can potentially have connectivity between your containers in Magnum and your VMs in Nova, which is actually super cool. Unfortunately, so there are no Ansible modules to manage the Magnum resources. So uh, that's something I opened that ticket and assigned to myself on the Ansible project. When, as time permits, I would like to just create modules to manage Magnum the same way we can manage Nova servers and neutral networks. And so other option is just use the official Kubernetes Ansible playbooks. So if you go to the Kubernetes GitHub organization, so they have a contrib uh, repo that contains a bunch of stuff. Within, there's an Ansible folder which contains playbooks and roles to install Kubernetes. You can use this project to install it in a bare metal that maybe you deploy with a Ronic or with a VM that you deploy with, uh, with your Nova. It's very easy to use. It's literally defining an inventory, an Ansible inventory for your master, your ECD cluster, your minions. You configure your Kubernetes options on groupvarsal.yaml, run deploy cluster, and you're done. It installs Kubernetes. So in the case of an OpenShift, so OpenShift is a pass based on Kubernetes. It provides an easy way to manage the entire lifecycle of applications. It, it uses the base building blocks of um, Kubernetes pods and services and all. But for an application developer, it gives a one layer app. So it really hides that kind of thing. And so app developers can just focus on their app development and they can just forget on the infrastructure that is below. So I wanted to point out that the open source project for OpenShift is OpenShift Origin, because there's been a bit of confusion lately, because there's been a few announcements around OpenShift. And we have now OpenShift Origin online, OpenShift IO, OpenShift Enterprise. So if you're looking for the OpenShift open source project, that's OpenShift Origin. That's right. Yep. So how we can install OpenShift. So unsurprisingly, the OpenShift folks, they thought that Ansible was a great um, thing to use to install and manage OpenShift. It's crazy how these days Ansible is becoming a de facto standard for installing complex software. So that project contains playbooks and roles to deploy on anything. Uh, if you go to the OpenShift Ansible project, it's going to contain readmes for installing in AWS, GCE, OpenStack. So it also going to, it's also going to provision the machines to host your OpenShift. But for generic installs, just define your inventory, your masters, your HCD cluster, your minions, just the same way as the Kubernetes Ansible installer. You run the bring your own config YAML playbook from, the, from OpenShift Ansible, and you're done. So now we run one layer app, and we have the virtual resources. So we have the IIS, we have the PaaS, and then we need a way to manage servers or resources from our OpenStack Cloud or resources from our Kubernetes cluster. So we need a way to do resource management for those things. So for OpenStack, I'm not going to spend much here. I mean, uh, Monty has spent quite a bit of time talking about this. He's a far better speaker than myself, so I'm not going to spend much for, for this. Let's say that with OpenStack, you cover. We have modules for managing pretty much everything. Nova servers to create the images, to create volumes, to create neutron routers, networks, Swift uh, object containers, everything. As an example, 
Here, we create a neutron router called my network on my cloud. Then we create a server called my server on my cloud, attach it to my network, and with a flavor with ID4, who knows if it's zeros or whatever. And then we inject uh, the keeper Ansible key so we can later access Ansible and do runs on it. Yeah. So for Kubernetes, there's the Kubernetes module in Ansible. So we do not have a specialized module for every type of Kubernetes resource. But the Kubernetes module allows you to fit in inline YAML defining the resource you want to manage. Or you can just point to a file containing the definition of the resource. So in this case, we are creating a namespace that is defined in that create namespace YAML against the Kubernetes and that IP with that username and password. And finally, we go up to applications layer. So here, we need a way as operators to manage, deploy applications in the classic way, let's say, and VMs or bare metal or containerized applications. So for deploying an application on VMs or bare metal, we can use the, the base building blocks we, we saw um, when on the server hardware layer, using the base building blocks of installing a package, starting a service, changing a file, or we can just use roles. What a role is. So, Ansible roles allow playback authors to decouple code from data. So when you, when you see a typical playbook, so you see at the top, host, whatever, you may have a bars section defining some variables and then tasks. So that means those tasks are going to run against the host that you define at the top and with the variables that you define at the playbook. That's great and works for an individual. But if you want to share that to someone else, that's a bit in inconvenient because you are passing environment-specific things in that playbook that is not relevant to the user that you, you share in that playbook. So a role just contains the task. Uh, it may have dependence of, of other roles. So a role for, I don't know, Apache 2 may have a, um, a dependency on a common role that has some baseline configuration like installing NTP or whatever. It may contain variables as well, but they're meant to be just defaults and variables that they're never, they, they won't be changing much, although you can pass variables to the role invocation, as I will be showing in a, in a bit, and it can contain handlers. So, okay, so I can, we can write the role, we can share it, but what if I want to install an Nginx or Apache 2 or something that is more complex, my SQL, a cluster of, I don't know, Zookeeper, and I, I do not want to write that on my own. So what, how can I search you know, for that? So there's the Ansible Galaxy at that URL, which is a hub containing roles. So you can just go to, with a browser to that URL, search whatever you need, and you, you pretty much assure that you're going to find something. So in this case, for example, so I wanted to install a Django, and I didn't want to write it on my own. So I went to the Galaxy Hub, put Django on the text box, and it gave me a bunch of roles with Django in the description. I opted to use that one, and I installed it with the Ansible Galaxy CLI. That means that I, I'm installing the Django role that belongs to the future eyes user. They are namespaced, the roles. That's to avoid having 3,000 Nginx roles and not knowing who, what belongs to. And then the, the way you invoke that role in a, in a playbook is that you use the roles directive. In this case, I'm saying, hey, I want to apply the future eyes Django role against all my web servers, and by the way, pass this variable 
release name this value. So it's common for roles in the Ansible Galaxy is going to contain the readme, what variables are exposed in the role, and you are supposed to define your place. That's what I meant for decoupling code and data. So now we can use roles to install stuff on our VMs or for meta, what if, uh, what we can do for containers. So it's pretty common these days, I mean, when you want to create a container, you create a Docker file, right? Although the Docker file, its syntax is a bit meh, <laughs> let's say. So what can we do as an Ansible user, Ansible operator, I want to use Ansible to create my containerized applications. So thankfully, my colleagues at Ansible, they, they've been working on this new-ish Ansible container project that manages the entire workflow of containerized applications by using Ansible. With it, you can build the image, you can run containers locally, you can ship them into an OpenShift online, whatever. We can do a deploy um, command that is going to create a, a, an Ansible role that, so I can transport that and install that container anywhere I want. It leverage, uh, leverages Ansible roles already available to create container apps. So that's the cool thing is that because we have so many roles, why I should be writing Docker files? If I want to create an Nginx, I just want to use an Nginx Ansible role. It has Ansible Galaxy integration, so Ansible container roles, you can also find them on Ansible Galaxy. And this is a bit of a, an example of the workflow. So let's say that I want to create my web app, which is containerized. I run Ansible container in it. My user, my web app, is going to create a skeleton. Among the, that skeleton is going to contain a container YAML file. The container YAML file is some sort of a, of a, the same thing you, you would do with Docker Compose YAML file. That's what you would put in this container YAML. That's why it is so similar to the Docker syntax. In this way, in this case, we're saying I want to define a web container that is going to be based on the Ubuntu Trust the image. By the way, I want to use my web app role, Ansible role, to create that container image, and I want to expose those ports. And what it should run the container, that's the command line. So once you, ha you have that, you do an Ansible container build. It's going to take that container YAML, is going to pull those roles from that container YAML, is going to create the container image. And you, are, you can push that to a Docker Hub or some other registry. And you can even ship it to a GCE, Kubernetes. You can ship it to OpenShift that you may have somewhere or that you're using OpenShift online. So you can really use Ansible to do containerized applications as well. So what I was trying to convey in this talk is that as an individual or as an organization, if you invest in Ansible, you are rest assured that you can manage your entire stack. So it's truly one tool to rule them all. You don't have to um, resort to some other tool. You are pretty sure that you're going to have everything you need, which is pretty much having an Ansible playbook, roll my stack YAML. And that's it. So you can find me on Freeno. I'm Mark Aurelio Cruz. You can find me on Pan Ansible, Pan Ansible Devil, OpenStack Shade. Shade is the library that we use for the Ansible modules, as Paul and Monty mentioned. I'm also hanging out on OpenStack Infra. And that's my Twitter. And I will be happy to talk to you now or whenever. Thank you.